Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us this evening. My name is Jordan and I work for the Trust. Tonight we'll be listening to a talk that's been organised by Rav and Brenda Todd and we'll be learning all about the mysteries of migration. As always, we are delighted to host these talks for free, but if you do enjoy the talk and would like to show some support, you can do so by visiting www.lrwt.co.uk forward slash donate. If we have time at the end of the talk, we will be hosting a short Q&A. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. And if you'd like to share some nice words to our uh, speakers this evening, please pop them in the chat box. OK, that's all from me. And I'll now hand you over to our speakers, Ralph and Brenda. Thank you very much, Jordan. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ralph, Brenda's sitting beside me doing the technical stuff. Uh, I'm going to be doing the speaking, but Brenda puts the talk together for me and uh, sorts out all the images to make sure they're in good condition. Uh, and as she's doing at the moment, trying to get our shared screen up. So I think we're almost ready to go. I hope it's a lovely evening where you are. It's absolutely gorgeous here in Bexley where we're sitting at the moment. And uh, fortunately, none of the home nations are playing football this evening so um, unless you're a France Germany fan perhaps you're not watching the, uh, the football. Just a little bit about myself um, I've actually been interested in bird watching natural history since a schoolboy really uh, but basically took off in a bigger way when I met Brenda and we started uh, evening classes uh, about 50 years ago now and we've been traveling enjoying wildlife mostly bird watching and wild watching uh, for some 50 years now. Um, I am a former trustee of the Kent Wildlife Trust. I was a trustee for 19 years, so I have a great uh, affinity and uh, empathy with the Wildlife Trust movement. So it's great to be talking to your trust this evening. What I'm not is an absolute authority on migration. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a ringer, I'm not a professional ornithologist. Um, I, I'm a very passionate uh, supporter of the BTO, RSPB and Wildlife Trusts. But as I said, I'm not an authority on migration. In fact, it's still a mystery to me. So th this is one of the reasons I started to just look at it a bit. We've traveled a lot, we've seen a lot, I've read quite a lot over the years. Uh, and I just thought it would be useful to pull it together for my own benefit to start with. And this talk evolved from it. So um, if I kick off, we have the same problem tonight as I had the other night. I can't seem to... Ah, there we go, we move on. Uh, I thought migration studies were something that had happened over the last 150 years or so, but uh, starting to research it, I soon found out that even Homer in the, the classic work, the Iliad, uh, compares the movements of the armies on the field of battle to the migration of the cranes in Asia Minor. And, uh, and many classic works have references to migration, mostly of birds, but uh, often of mammals as well. I suppose the first thing I did was look up what migration actually means. And uh, in my dictionary, it comes up with a regular seasonal movement of a population of organisms. So that's a fairly wide brief uh, for, for migration. And even just today in the news, uh, and over the last few years, we've heard an awful lot about the movement of people, um, whether that be through economic movement, political uh, or, or refugee. So in the human form, we're, we're looking at migration to better our lives, to improve ourselves, to, to give ourselves a chance. But even when we go on holiday, are we migrating? Some of us just go for a week or a fortnight, but there are many people who disappear from this country down to the Mediterranean for the winter months, under normal circumstances, of course. Brenda and I have wintered in, uh, had a three or four weeks in the United States on a few occasions, now in Florida and in Texan, where, Texas, where they welcome the winter Texans. So are they migrating from the northern states down to the sunnier, warmer Gulf states? I guess they probably, probably are. But for, for me and for us, it's really the wildlife migration that uh, inspires us and enthuses us uh, and intrigues us. Uh, and we, we, we've all read, seen television programmes, and I haven't, but some will have been fortunate enough to have seen this mass migration of wildebeest and uh, zebras across the river. And they're doing it again for the same reasons. They're wanting a better life or a seasonal life. They can 
hear the thunder, they can see the lightning, they can smell the rains coming down, they can feel the rains on their skin, and they eventually move across this dangerous river uh, to the lush green grasses on the other side to feed up, which enables them to get a better uh, body weight for the females to calf, to have their young, to be able to feed them properly. One of the things we have experienced a lot is whale watching and whale migration, whether it be in Baja California or in the Caribbean, you see the humpback whales coming down there for the winter months. Uh, they're breeding down there, they're calving down there, but they're also starving down there. Uh, and uh, the, the, the females down there will, will not have fed for perhaps the, the whole of the winter months. And they rely heavily on a huge migration, some 6,000 miles in some cases, up to the Arctic and to Alaska, where the rich waters filled with plankton and shrimp provide them with a few weeks, a few weeks, a uh, couple of months of plentiful feeding, which will then sustain them for that long migratory journey back to those winter quarters where they'll once again carve and, and breed. And bearing in mind that when they start that northerly migration with their young calf whales, which weigh almost the size of an elephant when they're born, they're requiring about 250 litres of milk a day to sustain the young ones. So a huge amount of energy is used, but uh, the migration is worth it for what they get at the end of it. The monarch butterfly is another extraordinary story of migration these tiny, tiny butterflies that weigh no more than a paperclip. They spend the winter gathered together in huge numbers on the mountains in a mountainous region in Mexico, making their way north to southern Canada, uh, which is the final destination of their migration. And they breed in the spring uh, and then they carry on moving up uh, and really breed in stages as they go north until they complete that migration. And Brenda and I were fortunate enough one year to be at Cape May in the autumn when they began that return journey from, from southern Canada down through the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States heading back to Mexico. And we witnessed the uh, massive movement of monarch butterflies and we were blessed with the opportunity with some local volunteers and professional um, naturalists to be able to uh, not ring the butterflies but as you can see here putting tiny little tags on them just to help the uh, process of understanding how long it takes for these small butterflies to move and where they're moving to and from. And of course uh, you don't have to go overseas at all to witness such migrations of butterflies. We do occasionally get this wonderful experience of the Painted Lady, which uh, winters in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Uh, and they, similar to the monarch, they have a step-by-step -step breeding migration route through, uh, through into Europe. And in 2009, I think it was, we had the most extraordinary influx of Painted Ladies. I think the estimate at the time was probably in excess of 11 million butterflies in the United Kingdom, as far as far north as the Highlands of Scotland down to the southwest and central London had large groups of painted ladies uh, flying around, which was a wonderful experience to see. I, just a couple of years ago, there was a, a similar, not quite such large numbers of migratory pattern coming through. And I, I think the Farne Islands had a thousand painted ladies on one island in one day, which is an extraordinary feat for the gain, a relatively small, very, very light butterfly. So these things happen sometimes for reasons, perhaps we don't always explain why, why it can explain why it happens, not every year, but occasionally, but weather will have a part to pay. But I think like the rest of us, the, the reason most of these animals and vertebrates of nature move is to improve themselves, to give themselves a chance for a better life or better breeding opportunities. And for us in the bird world, uh, we're coming very much, sadly, to the end of the spring migration. Almost all of the birds have arrived now. And the birds that we look forward to most, well, certainly we do, are uh, the swallows and the hirundines, the martins, the sand martins being one of the earlier ones that we see coming through South London, up the Thames, passing, using the Thames as a flyway, perhaps. This year's been quite different. We haven't seen so many 
but uh, for us, these are certainly the spring migrants that excite us. And I guess it is spring migration that's possibly the most exciting in so much that we know it's summer just around the corner for us. It, they are new arrivals uh, and it's quite exciting. Then again, the autumn migration is another thing that we experience in the British Isles. And aren't we so lucky in the British Isles to have these, this island state we live in that have the, 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 the opportunities, the landscape, the habitats to attract these uh, millions of birds that come through, many of them staying with us. But in autumn, it's the, perhaps the wader migration. I always think autumn is perhaps a bit more spectacular uh, in terms of migration. The numbers are often much larger. Uh, of course, there are many young birds involved uh, in the autumn migration, so the numbers would be larger. Autumn passage tends to be a bit slower. They're not such in a hurry to get to wherever they're going. Uh, in the spring, the rivals often are nesting, wanting the same nest sites they had the previous year and need to get there quickly. So the autumn is a much more slow, sedate affair, uh, spectacular with the numbers, and you get these extraordinary falls of passerines sometimes, uh, and thrushes coming from the continent. And then there's the winter visitors, the migrants from the north, again, as many of our wading birds are, coming from north to south. We, we often uh, instinctively think of migration as a birds going home for the winter or going back for the winter, going south for the winter. Well, of course, many birds do come south from the Arctic to, to spend the time with us. And uh, many of our birds, we call them our birds, but the uh, spring arrivals will go back south in the autumn. And the ducks are perhaps a feature of our winter migrants. We celebrate migration all around the world, whether it be the storks arriving to nest in some parts of Eastern Europe, but things like the Spurn Migration Festival, which we've attended, and there's a fantastic weekend of activities and fun, to the Hooping Crane Festival that we've attended in the Gulf of Mexico, and to the magnificent Raptor Watch, Hawk Watch Migration Festival at Cape May in the autumn. They're just a few of the many that we've experienced and enjoyed over the years. So here's a map that just gives you a, a slight indication of where all these birds are coming from and where they're going to. And birds, in fact, animals are moving day and night on land, sea and air all the year round at some place or some point. Anything from anchovies to zebras are, are, are migrating. So it's a huge, huge uh, natural phenomenon and just in Europe, Northern Europe and Africa, the relationship between these two continents is, is quite extraordinary, as you can see here. And one of the, the factors that you can see is much of the migration takes place over the relatively short sea crossings. And most birds, if they can, will uh, fly over land, um, some obviously over sea as well, but uh, this gives you some indication so why do they do it and what are the risks involved? Because there clearly are risks involved, but uh, I guess if we think about it, when we look at why birds are moving between the, the, the equatorial rainforests up to the northern hemisphere, I read that it's probably, we take it for granted, but perhaps birds have evolved um, following the, from equatorial, equatorial regions. They've followed the retreat of the, in the ice ages, moving north to take advantage of the, uh, of the food supply, of uh, getting away from such competition uh, and moving into areas with greater daylight, longer daylight. But the, the issues, the risks they face are many. Uh, just looking at one of the major routes across Africa, desertification is just one problem that they have to deal with every year. And over the last 30 or 40 years, that is clearly becoming more of a problem to many of our long distance migrants. Having to cross the, Sah the Sahara as this little spotted flycatcher does, traveling perhaps around a trip of seven and a half thousand kilometers, uh, trying to get to the same nest site every year. What a phenomenal experience it is for this bird to have to cross this uh, very hostile uh, landscape. 
and whether it's bar-headed geese over the Himalayas or uh, ringus or trying to get across the Pyrenees, mountainous ranges can be very, very hostile. The winds in the mountains, the conditions, late winters, harsh winters can all have an impact uh, on the small birds that use these funnels through these mountain ranges to migrate. And talking of the weather, weather clearly has a big impact on the good and the bad of migration uh, and none less so, more so than the, uh, the hurricanes that take place in, in the Americas during the autumn time. And here we can just have one example because millions of birds in North America fly down the Atlantic down to their wintering grounds in Central and South America. And if they get caught up in some of these uh, storms or these tail end of these hurricanes, they can finish up uh, in the United Kingdom, which what makes the Scilly Isles, uh, the Isles of Scilly uh, and some of the Scottish Islands so good uh, for the extraordinary, the rare and the exciting. And I like to use this old picture, one of the first pictures I could find of a twitch of an upland sandpiper uh, taken by the late David Hunt on the Isles of Scilly, of an upland sandpiper, uh, and then of a little crate from the eastern, uh, far east where it came to Bow Beach Reservoir a few years ago, found itself uh, completely out of kilter. And it's interesting how these birds behave differently when they find themselves uh, in these places they're not supposed to be. Sadly, the majority of these birds uh, won't survive, but uh, some of the waders and some of the gulls and the larger birds do are able to survive and some are able to reorientate themselves. Then of course there's the uh, man-made uh, hazards and risks that they take and uh, again one of the most horrific is the slaughter, the hunting uh, of uh, birds, passerines, raptors, all storks, the whole gambit of birds that migrate from Africa through to Europe in Libya and the Mediterranean, some of the Mediterranean islands the slaughter still goes on and very, very destructive. And uh, our own turtle dove is one bird that has suffered extraordinarily uh, through such uh, operations. And more recently, uh, Brenda and I have traveled since the last 30 years to the Pyrenees in Spain, a major migration route. And we've seen the proliferation of wind farms as indeed they are taking place in our own country. And uh, also the, uh, the, the coastal uh, wind farms as well are increasingly having an impact on uh, some birds. We heard just recently of uh, some geese being found dead uh, near uh, a wind farm in Holland, but much research goes on into the positioning of these wind farms uh, and much research goes on into the impact they have on migrating birds and they are having some impact, but it is a hazard that these birds do face. So given the hazards, given the potential problems, why do they do it? Well, I alluded to it just a little while ago by saying that uh, it's competition, competition for nest sites, competition for food, um, but perhaps more than anything it is the, uh, the, 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 the food that is available to them 24 hours a day in the Arctic, for instance. And even in the UK, daylight is much more extended than it would be in many parts of uh, Central, <coughs> Central Africa, where many of the long distance migrants like the sedge warblers, the willow warblers, the, uh, the white throats here, the common white throat depend on. Or perhaps it is the lack of predators, for instance, with these ground nesting birds like the waders uh, that we see here, a turnstone breeding up in the Arctic. So uh, again, the, the lack of predators, extended daylight, as I've mentioned, uh, if, you, if they're breeding up in the Arctic, they can have 24 hours daylight. And that really gives them uh, much more feeding opportunities, uh, the better temperatures, greater daylight, more vegetation, more insects e equals better productivity with eggs and successful hatching uh, of young. The abundance of food uh, is available to them. The competition for food, if all the birds stayed in their wintering quarters, would be unsustainable, I would suggest. But uh, here, as they move further north, competition for food is less. And the further north they go, 
Uh, there's less diversity of wildlife, fewer species of birds, perhaps greater numbers of fewer species than there would be in the wintering quarters. Uh, and uh, I, I took this picture of our car a couple of three years ago, but uh, I should have had one of the splatter uh, uh, devices to, to use to count the number of insects because this was, a, I took this picture only because it was such a rare picture. I was traveling through Scotland and uh, we had uh, an inundation of insects over the car, which is something we don't ever get in, the, in Southern England. But that's another reason, the abundance of food is one of the reasons these birds are prepared to take that risk. Uh, this is a picture of the top one taken in Morocco, but uh, wherever we've traveled, whether it be in the Far East or in Africa, we've noticed that in the forested areas where many of our wintering birds would be, there's a much greater density of potential um, potential uh, predators, whether it be snakes, which we don't have many of in Northern Europe, um, bongos, monkeys as a whole, gambit of uh, of tree predators in addition to the, the ground predators. And it is the some of the ground nesting birds that uh, we play host to in the winter months, the birds that are coming down from the Arctic, migrating down from the Arctic, coming to spend the winter with us in huge numbers, like these barnacle geese. This is the Svalbard population of uh, barnacle geese that winter on the Solway and the uh, Icelandic population, the hooper swans that come down to, to, to Welney every year. I'm not saying we don't have our ground predators. In fact, the UK does have quite a large number of ground predators, not only the fox, but uh, the badger, hedgehog, weasels, polecats, rats, uh, many ground predators. So perhaps that's why we don't have such a huge number of um, ground nesting birds and most of the wading birds and ducks and geese, uh, the ground nesting birds, move further north to the Arctic, where they may just have an Arctic fox, perhaps a wolverine and perhaps a polar bear. There's really the only mammalian predators um, that they may well encounter. So, as I've said, the barnacle goose will go further north to, to, to lay its eggs and to hopefully successfully raise its young and it seems the Svalbard population is increasing considerably over the last few years. The Dotrell is an interesting migrant from uh, North Africa and it will come to us in the spring, uh, late spring, it's uh, one of the later arrivals and they will often hang around in Scotland and breed and uh, the female, as I'm sure you know, is the, the bird that lays the eggs but then leaves the male to the incubation and looking after the young. But the, she will then, a bit like the butterfly, she will continue on to another stage and often finish up in Scandinavia, Norway, where she will mate again and lay another clutch of eggs. And then there's the turnstone, a favourite bird of mine, Sadly, don't see them that often in this lovely plumage, but it's a wading bird that we get in good numbers around the southeast in, in the winter time. But that migrates uh, again up to the Arctic where it breeds. Again, it's a ground nesting bird. And I was fascinated to, to hear a story um, of somebody who's researched the turnstones that winter here in Kent, that on their breeding grounds, the, uh, the turnstone has a small territory, no larger than around about 500 square meters in size. That's its total range when it gets there, that's all it sees. Then when it comes down to Kent and spends time around our shoreline down on the Isle of Thanet, it's estimated that they perhaps use no more than up to four or 500 feet of beach to spend the whole of the winter meters, uh, four or 500 meters of beach to carry out their feeding, resting and roosting during the winter months. So that little turnstone travels all that way, huge distances, and perhaps never sees anything or much at all. It may perhaps see a polar bear and perhaps the photographer who took this photograph, in which in this case it was me, a very limited life they lead. Then Hooper swans, of course, in Iceland, this is taken in Iceland. And the bottom picture is really just going to remind it to me that Birds are finding things slightly difficult. One of the other changes, perhaps not a risk, but the change is climate change. And if birds arrive at the, their nesting destination at the wrong time, 
they may find that the areas are still covered in snow and uh, nesting is not possible for much later. Or they may get there too early, too, too late, when the insect uh, population has already hatched and uh, they've missed an opportunity for feeding their young. So it's an extraordinarily clever uh, thing that they do because we believe that migration really is very instinctive uh, and uh, genetic thing. So we have a few long distance migrants that come to us, I think over about 220 species are known to breed in the uh, British Isles and I think about 40 of them are reckoned to be long distance migrants and most of those are insect eating species like the house martin, the swallow, wheat here, one of the earlier arrivals along with the sand martin. So these are long distance migrants, these are the ones that have to get across the Sahara Desert and perhaps it's no coincidence that some of those species are the ones that we're seeing declining in, in significant numbers like the house martin, like the spotted flycatchers and the wood warblers. This is just a, another indicative map really giving some indication of where birds are coming from and going to and this is an autumn picture looking at birds that are coming from the far north of Scandinavia and Russia coming spending the winter with us and all those various other species the warblers, the wagtails, the hirundines uh, heading away from us down through France, Spain, Italy, down into Central and West Africa and in the case of the, the swallow of course and one or two others all the way down to South Africa. And the birds that were coming to us are the thrushes uh, uh, and the like. And that's when our gardens can become quite an important aspect of migration. This is, happens to be our garden in the summer. It doesn't look at all like that because I haven't mown the lawn for three years. So um, I really ought to take another picture to show it as in all its glory with all the uh, meadow flowers such as they are. And I guess some people are lucky enough to have some of those long distance migrants breeding in their garden. But I guess what we appreciate most of all about migration is the autumn migration when birds were arriving in our gardens if like us, you, you have a few blue tits and perhaps robin, blackbird, the resident birds that uh, are, are with us most of the year round breeding in your garden, because we are putting up nest boxes perhaps, or we're feeding the birds throughout the year. But it's the time of year that we also see um, the arrival of, of those other migrant species. And we talked about long distance migrants like the, uh, the hirundines and uh, the warblers, but there are short distance migrants as well. And I was intrigued a few years ago when I was a RSPB group leader, I used to have a lot of birds brought to me. And then one day somebody brought me a, a wren that they had found in their garden, just a couple of streets away from us with a ring on it. And they were intrigued as indeed was I. And when I sent it away to the BTO uh, for, uh, for, identification, I learned that this little tiny little bird had just come all the way from Cambridge here uh, and it coincided with a real cold snap um, in, in Cambridge here that it had moved just a few miles, well just a few tens of miles from Cambridge to Bexley. And then as the story of the blackbird that was ringed in Thetford in 2003, it was ringed as in the July and it was seen around the area until late September. When it was next reported to BTO having been seen on Boxing Day in Newton Abbott in Devon, which was an interesting statistic in itself, but it became more interesting when the bird was next seen in uh, Thetford again the following year uh, in I think late February it was seen um, in, in Thetford again, seen throughout that summer and most bizarrely and extraordinarily, I would say it was seen again and on the Boxing Day in Newton Abbott in 2004, uh, arriving last seen there in, in late January 2005, not to be seen again. But that just demonstrates that this bird, for some reason, was moving a short distance. It didn't feel the need to fly into Europe, but just a little bit further south where the temperature was probably just a little bit warmer than it was up in uh, East Anglia. But we're more used to seeing the uh, influxes of uh, winter thrushes, the field fairs and the red wings, uh, particularly uh, we see them in, in northern Europe and in Iceland 
you'll see them feed both species feeding on the ground on invertebrates in amongst the vegetation. But when they get to us, uh, unlike our blackbirds and the song thrush, missile thrush, which do depend on unfrozen ground to sustain themselves through the winter, these birds are quite happy as our own thrushes are to adapt their, their feed from, from invertebrates and earthworms uh, to, to, to berries, which is what we can see happening here with the uh, red wing in the, uh, in the lower picture. So they can adapt their food and they will adapt their food. But we mustn't assume that the blackbirds, robins, the wood pigeons, the starlings that we have in our gardens during the autumn winter months are, are the birds that have been there all year round. Some of them will move um, short distances to perhaps northern Europe or to, to the southwest of England, but most will, will stay with us. The blackbirds and the robins will stay with us. But we also now know through various methods, mostly ringing, uh, that these birds are supplemented by a huge number of continental birds. Uh, and interestingly enough, we, it seems that Scandinavian robins do move south and they do come to us in the winter, whereas our own robins tend to be uh, sticking around in certainly southern England. Uh, they, they stay around in, in their sort of nesting breeding areas. And they seem quite happy to uh, accept these continental robins in the autumn and winter. We've often had two, three robins in the garden at the same time, but come nesting season, they become extraordinarily territorial. Chaffinches, I often wondered why I see more chaffinches, female chaffinches in the winter than I do, uh, do males and there's a place I go to quite close to here to ca count these species and it's always dominated by female chaffinches and the, again the, the migration of these birds from Scandinavia it seems the females are the ones that migrate in huge numbers with the males um, staying around mostly in their breeding areas unless it's incredibly harsh weather which is one of the dominant features of migration weather this is one of the things that will uh, make these birds move and I'm sure we've all seen, experienced, or want to see an experience of starling murmuration. But of course, these are mostly continental birds that gather in these huge murmurations. And that's why it's often best to perhaps wait until late December, January time before one gets an opportunity to see these huge murmurations. And things are changing. We're noticing that black caps are being seen in our gardens much more in the winter time now than they once were. Uh, and that's not because of hugely successful breeding necessarily, but it's because the birds from Central Europe, and well, Germany in particular, have been found to be coming to here to, to spend the winter, a milder climate, uh, plenty of food available in gardens, uh, so they don't need to take that long winter journey down into southern Spain and North Africa to spend the winter. And even our own, some of our own birds don't need to migrate because they can sustain themselves during the winter. There is enough grubs in the bark of trees and perhaps more recently in gardens themselves for birds like the nuthatch, the tree creeper and the woodpecker to sustain themselves through the winter months. Different types of migration, something known as altitudinal migration. Uh, red grouse and ptarmigan, the birds of uh, the uplands in Scotland, which uh, Brenda and I spend quite a bit of time. And the red grouse, for instance, in the in the winter will drop down the mountainside. So they will move down the slopes closer to the, uh, the milder snow free areas to feed. Ptarmigan, on the other hand, are quite interesting. The ptarmigan not only does it change colour, so that it uh, can stay within these snow covered areas um, to blend in with white plumage here. But their migration can sometimes take them up the mountain, particularly towards the end of summer when there's more bare ground exposed, they will move up the mountain to feed and then during winter drop down like the red grouse to the lower slopes. So that's known as altitudinal migration. And this is a feature of wall creeper, a lovely bird of the Pyrenees and the Himalayas. Uh, they will spend their summers breeding up in the mountain tops, high up in the mountains, and will often just drop down to the riverbeds and to the nearby villages to spend the winter. Whereas our classic upland bird, the meadow pipit, spending its time in the uplands, will go down to coastal marshes to, to spend the winter. So these are known as altitudinal. 
And then there's the malt, malting, malting um, migration. Ducks, as you know, will uh, molt all their feathers at the same time, go into a clips and generally go into fairly safe areas. And the classic uh, there is the shell duck, which will gather in huge numbers from across Europe uh, in the German Bight and the Wadden Sea. And sometimes in August, there can be up to 100,000 shell duck all there, molting their feathers at the same time, safety in numbers being the message. And understand Bridgewater Bay is also home to quite a gathering of these uh, colourful species. And then finally, there's eruptive migration. And I hope we've all experienced something along, along those lines. There's the classic waxwing year. We don't get them every year, sadly, but uh, every so often we'll have a, a classic waxwing year when there can be hundreds of waxwings moving through the country, often seen first in Scotland and then moving down through the country. And we often get small flocks here in the south. Uh, the jay, a huge uh, movement of those in the 1980s, 1983, there was tens of thousands of these birds moving across our country. I think 3,000 in one flock went past Plymouth on one day. They are quite extraordinary and unusual. Uh, coal tits in 1996, there was a big influx of coal tits. And what was it, two or three years ago, there was a large hawfinch influx. These are eruptive or occasional migrations, probably led by lack of food in the traditional feeding areas in the autumn, winter time, or perhaps just an explosion in population, a particularly good breeding year, uh, and birds move away from those traditional winter areas and arriving with us. Just a little look at the history of migration, which I, I tried to do, and uh, the, the couple of old uh, sort of woodcuts here, one, one, one showing Aulus Magnus's account of life in Scandinavia, which to the local populations and just fixed in this idea that some of these birds that we now know to migrate actually spent the winter uh, hibernating in the mud uh, uh, riverbeds. Uh, and the picture on the right is, is just a bit of fantasy, really, that uh, uh, in those days back in the 15th, 16th century, there would have been people who just fantasized that perhaps birds drifted off away from there where they'd seen them during the summertime, drifted off into the heavens and up to uh, up to the moon in this case. So he's got this contraption to take him northerly like that. But even uh, Carl Linnaeus, the, 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 the great Swedish botanist, um, he, he, he subscribed to that view of uh, birds uh, spending the winter in the mud right up to the late sort of 18th century. Carl Jenner, on the other hand, Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner, sorry, Edward Jenner. This is the other reason Brenda's named as the speaker because she corrects me at these occasions. This is the guy who actually um, um, pioneered the very first vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, but he was also an ornithologist. And uh, he, 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 he discovered, the, he, well, he's basically noticed that there were huge influxes of thrushes in the wintertime and started to think about migration and where these birds were coming from. So by the late 18th century, the, the migration was something that was being discussed, being written about, being thought about in some great detail. John Legg, another, another ornithologist of the period, he was writing papers on uh, the theories and he, he was getting his theories in practice from sailors who were coming back telling him that they, they had seen our birds, those swallows, our birds, they'd seen them as they were sailing south and the swallows were following them southwards and he, he started to put thoughts together. And then of course Gilbert White, uh, the, the author of the classic uh, natural history and antiquities of Selborne, one of the uh, pioneers again of, uh, of migration studies. And he, he had these thoughts about the swallows um, resting in the oozier beds by Sumbrian on Thames, which is the little picture you can see in the bottom left there. But he did many studies. He was the guy who sort of really separated chip chaff, willow warbler and, and wood warbler. And along with Jenner uh, and uh, John Audubon in, in the States, uh, they, they used to put little cotton tags around the legs of nesting birds just to see if they would come back to the same nest next year. And the, the early historians, lateral historians, this is how they worked. And 
how they pioneered uh, the thoughts on migration. And of course, uh, we, we have the uh, uh, Eagle Clark studies in bird migration published in, in 1912. Uh, so things moved on uh, during the uh, 19th century and into the 20th century with a better understanding. So how, but how do these birds do it? This is the other major question. Why do they do it and how do they do it? Well, unlike this swallow here uh, up in the Hebrides, uh, this uh, rather bonkers sign that we came across uh, up in uh, Lewis and Harris, this way, that way, right way, wrong way and dead end, um, or in, in Norway, if you're looking for a sign, this is it. Um, they, they, they don't have signposts, so uh, we're, we're pretty sure that they have inbuilt orientation tools, a whole range of them, in fact. Not, there's no one orientation tool that uh, the, these birds use. But what must it be like for, for a young swallow? Um, you're, you're hatched out of an egg here in, in early summer by your parents, and you're looked after, you're fed all the way through that sort of until fledgling. And then you're basically kicked out and you're off and your parents are raising a second brood and in some cases a third brood. And there you are on your own and you've got to make your way all those thousands of miles down to South Africa. And then you've got to come back again and start the process again. How do they do that? What about the poor puffin? And we, aren't we lucky in this country to have sort of the opportunities to see breeding puffins around our coastline? So important. And here, as we speak, there will be parents feeding their young, looking very lovely. Uh, and the young pufflings will then be left. They will be stuffed with food, filled up, and then the adults will disappear, leaving the uh, youngsters to gradually become hungrier and hungrier until they just leap off the cliff themselves to go where? How do they know where to go? How do they know when and where to come back to? Extraordinary. And the most extraordinary thing of all is the cuckoo. Um, we've had a couple of cuckoos on our local nature reserve here in Bexley this year. But they don't even see their parents. At the time they hatch out of the egg, they're being looked after by perhaps a reed warbler, but most likely a dunnock or perhaps a meadow pipit, neither of which migrate themselves. So how on earth does a cuckoo know that it's got to migrate all that way south and then come back again at some time later? Well, we think it's all genetic. There's a built-in compass, it's cultural, it's evolutionary. There are triggers, there are length of daylight, there are temperatures, uh, food supply, a whole range of things uh, that uh, impact on these. Their inbuilt uh, compass relies on the stars, on the sun, on the moon. All of these are, are aids, are tools to enable them to do it. But I am not going to claim that I can explain it. Um, the BTO have done some master classes in there in their magazines to help us understand it. But so in using the, the sky, the stars, moon, sun, compass, they also use landmarks, landscapes, landmarks like bridges, they follow rivers and um, it's believed. Some like this willow warbler and I do give talks on cruise ships so I know this to be the case, they actually take a lift but that's a that's a rare occurrence but uh, they do, uh, the, the, they will take a lift uh, as they did on this ship. We've had swallows and uh, willow warblers, wagtails land on the ship, but that's cheating. Not many of them get the chance to do that. Larger birds, of course, they, they, they will, many of them will migrate during the day. So they're not using the, the, the stars and the, the moon. They're just using perhaps the sun and their internal compass. And birds like geese and cranes, they will often, um, use experience, there's genetic built-in uh, learning that they have and you'll have the adults and the experienced birds perhaps leading the, uh, the arrow, leading the, leading the flock of birds through the sky, um, particularly cranes. They seem to know the best resting places, um, when to stop, when to go, when to, uh, we witnessed it in the Pyrenees when the winds and the cold has been so severe that they've just turned back. They know instinctively not to bother to go any further so they'll turn back and to the, sort of somewhere like Lac de Dare where they'll stay for a few days. 
But it's these larger birds, particularly, um, that uh, they have this inbuilt genetic instinct as to when to go and, and what to do. And the youngsters will follow and learn from them and learn the best staging places. Which is why in some cases, whether it be the bald ibis that has been reintroduced to places or the hooping crane here in America that has been reintroduced, some of these birds actually do need human intervention uh, to actually teach them what to do and how to do it. Uh, and there have been some successful and some less successful attempts to do this uh, across the world. I guess one of the, um, uh, I guess one of the um, classic um, migration stories is that of the Manx shearwater, which goes down uh, and, and breeds on the Pembrokeshire coast in, in the UK here, uh, and then spends the, the winter down off Brazil and Argentina, a round trip of 6,000 miles. And, some of the pioneering work in this country, particularly uh, on migration uh, and particularly with the Manx Shearwater, was done here on Skulkham uh, by, by, by the late great Ronald Lockley, uh, who, who just got an inkling of, of this. He, there, there were papers that a uh, bird had been left uh, let go at Start Point in Devon at two o'clock one afternoon and had arrived back at its nest at 11 o'clock that night. Another one had been let go in Venice and arrived back 14 days later at, the, at its nest hole. So the experiment that really caught the imagination uh, the, 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 was in Boston uh, when, it, when one was flown over there uh, and released uh, and it was back at its nest in Pembrokeshire 12 and a half days later. I think it was two days after that that Ronald Lockley got the letter uh, from the person who released it to say that he had released the bird um, the letter arrived after the bird did. But an, an, an extraordinary ability that can only be really inbuilt into the, into the birds. And we've learned a huge amount more from bird observatories um, that uh, started up in the 1930s. I think Stuxcocum was the first bird observatory in, in 1933. We've now got them uh, around our coastline. The most recent was in Alderney in 2017. Uh, and they have one thing in common, they, they usually are either on islands or are, are on exposed promontories like here, our local, one of our local observatories uh, here in Dungeness. We have, this is the landscape of Dungeness, um, right out into the English Channel there, but dotted around with the, all this vegetation, isolated vegetation around this uh, shingle desert, which is just a magnet for, for, for migrant birds coming in, particularly in the springtime landing here tired, hungry, and this is their first landfall. Uh, or, 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 or a favourite of ours where we spend a month every autumn is here at Portland Bill, again on the promontory looking out into the, uh, into the channel there. And uh, there's a whole variety of ways of catching birds. This is not something I appreciate that everybody agrees with, but uh, over the years we have learned so much. These uh, Heligoland traps here at Dungeness and at Sandwich Bay. We're lucky in Kent we have two bird observatories. Or well, mist nets is the uh, other way of, uh, of catching these birds. And here you can see Martin Cader, the warden. And uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, I'm sure there's ringing it happens at Rutland Water and Eggleton Water. You've got bearded tits here being ringed and a tiny little ring that is affixed to their leg, which uh, can be returned to the Natural History Museum or BTO for, for further information. Ringing is generally carried out by uh, a few professional wardens, ornithologists, but mostly an army of dedicated uh, and skilled and qualified amateur uh, ornithologists and bird ringers. And it's from here that we've learned over the years so much information. Uh, and uh, they, they measure them, they weigh them, uh, they understand a lot more about these birds. And we can then start to see what's going on. We can see this gentleman here, he's actually blowing in uh, to the breast feathers of the, of the bird he's caught. And he's doing that to try and find out the body weight, the, the body the fat mass of these birds. Because when birds migrate, there are two other things that are very important to them. And that's their own health and fitness, if you like. So the plumage has to be spot on, it has to be perfect. So many birds will molt out their post breeding feathers after the breeding season and have pristine feathers before they fly off. Some of them will breed, molt half and then half perhaps when they on the journey. Young birds will molt out their juvenile feathers to have strong feathers for the migration. 
And then there's the body mass weight, of course. And many birds will feed up um, for 10, 12, 15, 20 days extensively before they embark on that long journey. In the bottom here, we've got a short, short distance migrant, the linnet. Uh, they, 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 they move perhaps a short distance within this country or just across the continent. They may put on about 10% of their body weight, whereas the sedge warbler, which could actually go from the south of England all the way down to sub-Saharan Africa in one go, will put on over 50% of its body weight. So it can go, can go from nine grams to almost 18 grams before it's then ready to prepare to migrate. And here you can see the body mass being fat being checked there and they store that fat in muscles even eyelids they've been saying to store that this also gives us opportunities to see birds in the hand and to understudy them better willow warbler chip jeff willow warbler, willow warbler. and you, you also get some real corkers as well like the red-eyed vireo one of those birds that blown over from america uh, that uh, we saw at Portland and, and yellow browed warbler, which is an interesting one because yellow browed warblers should be going southeast. They should be going into Southeast Asia on their migration. But more and more recently, they've been coming west. We've been seeing far more in the UK and in Western Europe over the recent years. Uh, and there's no work taking place. And we're now believing that these, this bird is breeding further west and perhaps as a pioneer population moving further west and will be wintering more. And, uh, and just a, another aside for bird observing, what a great opportunity for little children to go and see, witness this. And as this little boy here is hand holding a black cap. And this is all undertaken by the, uh, the, 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 the BTO, fantastic organization uh, overseeing all this work and the Bird, Obs bird Observatories Council as well. Falsterbo in Sweden is probably one of the nearest and classic places to, to go and witness mass migration of birds from Northern Europe. Chaffinches, you, you, average autumn migration over 800,000, but on one, one day 800,000 and uh, huge numbers. Wood pigeons average 30,000, but one day in 2018, nearly 350,000 wood pigeons. So we looked at that ringing and we, 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 we learned a huge amount from it, but the, the BTO, I think they ring about 800,000 birds every year and they get very few recoveries, perhaps about 15,000 recoveries a year. So it's a very small percentage relative to what they can learn from. And of course, uh, some, something very dear to our hearts, Brenda and I were volunteering Operation Osprey in the mid seventies and got to know Roy Dennis and the work he was doing then. Uh, and this is the way we heard about ringing. This was the first picture we saw of ringing recoveries, an old map with blue stickers all over it. These are where ospreys had been recovered in the 70s. Then with your own uh, magnificent um, reintroduction program, at Rutland Water, technology was able to progress with it and uh, started off with satellite um, or radio tagging, which was helpful to know what the birds were doing locally. But um, beyond that, you needed to move on to satellite tagging, which again was sort of undertaken with the birds at Rutland in a, in, in a big way. And we were able to learn about where these birds went, how, how long it took them to get places from stage to stage. And even sadly, when one veered off into the Bay of Biscay and was lost, uh, at least um, one could uh, ascertain that, that that was what had happened through this tracking. And in more recent times, there's been um, such huge developments. And uh, uh, as you probably already gathered with Brenda setting up the whole thing for me at the beginning of this session, I, I am just not a techno person at all. So I fail miserably to really understand how this works. But uh, geolocators uh, are, are much smaller now and bounce off um, satellites and uh, can give you up to date hard information about where birds are moving. moving. Some of the geolocator systems, you have to recover the, the actual system to download the information. Others, it's bounced straight back at you. And uh, using just uh, basic technology of uh, solar uh, and a few bits and pieces, uh, you, they can determine where the birds are, even how high they're flying sometimes. And they can work out whether the bird is active or or flying or moving and how fast it's moving. Extraordinary technology and it's getting smaller and it's getting smaller. So now we can look at putting these systems on to small birds like swifts and swallows and nightingales. 
uh, the future it looks just so incredibly uh, exciting and interesting, uh, taking migration and uh, what these birds are doing to a completely new level. Um, and it'd be very interesting to be around in 10 years time to look back to see what has been learnt through these studies. We, we can gather a lot from these, um, the, the, the systems, the old ringing systems, uh, and the new technology is showing us that Manx Shearwater, for instance, its circular route that it takes, and about 6,000 miles. And given that Manx Shearwaters can live for up to 50 years, um, I think somebody estimated they could fly to the moon and back five times if they uh, did that migration e every year. And a couple of birds, there's the turtle dove, which uh, is really a, a very sad story, um, what's happening to the turtle dove. Uh, but a lot of work's happening with swifts and, and cuckoos as well uh, as the turtle dove, and just have a quick look at that. The, the, obviously, this information is relevant, but um, it, it's uh, a little bit out of date. There's more up-to-date information. The cuckoo is one of the pioneer uh, birds that has been used to, uh, using this technology. But again, it was very interesting to, to, to have a talk uh, by a BTO member recently to, to just see what they've found out that the birds they ring in East Anglia, for instance, go down this eastern route uh, down in, in, into central Africa, whereas the birds from northern England tend to go down the western route. And it's interesting where they have knowledge of fatalities that it's the birds on the western route that seem to suffer greater fatality rates than those that go down the eastern route. But interestingly enough, they, 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 they all come up much the same way um, on their return migration back to, to the UK. But what the, the, this system has also told us is that not only do they spend the winter in the Congo Basin and the Gabon, but they move uh, into, uh, into the Gulf of Guinea, uh, over to the West Africa, where there is a huge um, area of wetlands due to the, the rains in that part of the world in, in late winter, early spring or late winter predominantly, um, which provides the most amazing food uh, in the form of insects and termites uh, for, for these birds. So you'll see there's a spring stopover and that's where they're feeding up extensively before they then make that quick journey back to, to, to the UK, which I just said, said about earlier. Uh, and I'll mention it again in relation to the swift, because the swift again has, has found out so much about this bird. Uh, and there's dates dotted around there as to how it moved down through Europe and then down through Africa and into Central Africa, which is where we thought they, they, they were probably wintering. Um, swifts like the house martin are, are, are aerial birds. They, they feed on the wing and they almost entirely live on the wing. So up to now, knowing where they go, wh where they winter and what they do in their winter quarters has been almost impossible to tell because they're not landing anywhere. So we now know that they do go to that part of uh, Central Africa and as do the uh, cuckoos and many, many other species. But what we didn't know is that after a, a quite a while spending time in that central area feeding up, they, this particular bird, so we assume others, um, just shot off down to the uh, coast, the Mozambique coast uh, on the east coast of Africa there uh, and drifted around there for a few weeks before waking, making its way back for a short period into the Central Africa. But then again, it also went to this area in West Africa where there is this extensive uh, opportunity for feeding. And then it made its way quickly back to, to the UK. And of course the swift, as I'm sure you know, like the nightjar and the spotted flycatcher is, is one of the last to, to arrive on spring migration. And indeed the swift is one of the earliest to leave. It spends very little time here, as does the cuckoo. In fact, some cuckoos are already beginning their journey south as we speak, um, before some of the last arrivals have arrived here. But one of the worrying things that we're, we can now see what might be happening is to do with climate change, which is the one thing I haven't really said much about at all tonight, which is a, clearly a risk um, 
to, to the whole of the natural world and indeed the, the human population as well. But what one's thinking now is that the climate change is clearly having a big impact in Northern Europe uh, and in the Northern Hemisphere, generally in Northern Europe, whereas it's not having such a great impact at such great speed in equatorial countries. Um, so the rainfalls in uh, the Guinea, uh, Guinea uh, area is very much the same as it was, uh, hasn't changed much. But the uh, growth of vegetation uh, and the uh, change in the insect invertebrate populations is changing in the northern hemisphere. So are these birds leaving their winter quarters at the same time and now arriving in the UK and in northern Europe too late? Is that a possibility? Um, that's where studies are now taking the whole process forward, all thanks to this technology, which has enabled us to see where these birds are going and what they're doing. So um, I think I'm coming to the end of the talk. Um, today, uh, just today, literally today, on the River Thames here in Bexley, we had eight curlews arrive, which suggests to us that autumn migration has begun. Um, these are probably non-breeding birds, it has to be said, but it is a sign that um, we always used to think the first week in July would be the time we might see the first uh, waders coming back. Um, well, we've got eight curly back today, so that is very early. But it won't be long, folks, before the uh, autumn migration starts and you'll see your swallows lining up on the uh, telegraph wires, waiting to make that extraordinary journey back to South Africa starlings and woodpeckers and uh, wood, wood pigeons arriving in huge numbers uh, into this country. Um, we think they might be owl birds but they possibly aren't, they could well be continental birds. So um, I found the whole thing fascinating uh, to looking at it. I still think it to be a complete mystery to me how they do it uh, but all I know is I enjoy every year waiting for them to come and that month down in Portland uh, every September, October, uh, waiting to see uh, them go and what else might turn up in, in the process. So whilst I try to take and use most of the photographs that Brenda and I take ourselves, there, there are others here that I, I have to thank either for their images, their maps or their cooperation. Uh, and I, I just like to thank you very much for inviting us to give this presentation this evening. Uh, very good to be with you on a lovely sunny summer's evening. Bexley, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of everyone um, that we all really enjoyed that talk. We've had lots of uh, comments and questions coming through. Um, are you happy to answer some? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we've, got, we've got a mix and some in the Q&A box and the chat box. Um, so one of our attendees has asked, I'll just go from send in order, uh, through your travels, what was the most exciting migration uh, or species to see? Oh, well, um, we are passionate about cranes. Um, I love the, the Eurasian crane. We've been lucky enough to see 11 of the 15 species of cranes, but we've probably spent as much time watching cranes as we have ospreys, our two favourite birds. Um, so the arrival of the osprey at Lock Garden every year was always a magnificent treat. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the big flocks of cranes passing through Lactodere in France uh, is another. Um, and we have, in fact, we do a talk on the Trail of the Crane, which follows the cranes from Estamadura. Uh, in Spain and I've actually seen the first ones arrive at a frozen lake in Finland one year and that was really hairs on the back of your neck stuff because I wasn't expecting to see that. Oh, uh, so yeah that, that, that whale watching as well we've been to Baja the last couple of years ago we went to Alaska to see them up there feeding so that was great as well. Yeah one of my dreams to spot a whale it will happen one day. <laughs> um, another one is from Jodie and she said have you noticed an increase in birds visiting your garden by not mowing the grass? Yes. Well yes I have. Um, lots of insects and of course of bugs but what is really exciting uh, and um, is the number of house sparrows. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've been lucky we lost house sparrows for about 15 years and I guess about six or seven years ago we started to get them back and they were roosting in a bush, in a fairly sizable bush in our neighbour's garden next to us. 
But since I stopped mowing the lawn, um, they love it, and they're they're stretching up to get the uh, seeds off the um, off the grasses, grasses and uh, the flowers. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Wow, lovely to see. I'm um, just going through the chat now. We've had some people pop the answers in there. So Claire Evans said, um, "What are the main reasons for the birds you mentioned to be slaughtered?" Um, mentioned that early in the talk. Oh, well that's a pretty um, controversial subject all around isn't it because for many of these countries where it takes place it's it's part of their culture the Malta is part of Italy um, uh, it, it's just very much part of their culture uh, it, yeah. it, it, can I give justify a reason I can't justify a reason there are there are parts of the world where, where, where birds are, and animals are taken sustainably for food um, and you can justify that. You perhaps can't criticise that. But most of the hunting that I've, and I haven't witnessed a huge amount, I saw a little bit in Cyprus once and I've seen a little bit in the Pyrenees. Um, uh, there is no justification for it. I can't, can't see what the justification is. It can't be the countries where it's taking place with the, with the possible exception of I don't know, perhaps well, it's Lebanon, Libya, uh, the, 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 the uh, European countries, there can be no justification for food. You know, it's just a cultural thing, which uh, and it's, one gets the impression it's almost bloody mindedness, you know, because. Yeah. Because it's a different. Uh, we can have that conversation for hours, can't we? <laughs> <to do> with <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> um, Another one would be from Emily. Uh, she said, can you tell us about the rarest migrant species you've seen in the UK? Um, also, how do birds navigate over the huge distance? I've seen somewhere that they can use the stars. Is this correct? Yeah. Well, on that one, the, la the latter part, yes, it, 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 it's a whole, well, as I think, perhaps I didn't explain it well enough, perhaps I don't understand it well enough, but there seems to be a whole range of tools it's not just one thing um, for different species it's different ways but yeah they, they, there's this inbuilt compass that they must have it, it, it's in, it can be instinctive but you can't tell me that a cuckoo that doesn't even know its parents knows where to go it's got to be something inbuilt within its own inbuilt compass that enables it to follow some magnetic field produced by the sun or the start you know the solar system uh, that enables it but I'm not as I said right at the beginning I'm not an authority expert I'm just as intrigued as uh, your your questioner as to how it happens but I'm not sure that anyone knows there is one answer to that question rarest bird I've seen in this country or don't I'm not a twitcher so I don't I don't go after rare birds but we spend a month in Dorset every year partly because it's Brenda's um, family home partly because we can um, and we just like to be down there at a good time of year so that that, that red-eyed vireo for instance was, was pretty exciting I'd never seen one uh, anywhere let alone in this country and you get those things but uh, they don't excite me as much as the house sparrows feeding on my insects and in, in, in seeds in the garden at the moment <laughs> Um, I was we'll do a couple more. Um, can you recommend any good books about migration as a follow-up to the talk? Um, well, there's a good book that I partly read, and I wish I'd read it in more detail um, some time ago. It's by Jim Flegg. It was published by the BTO. Um, uh, I, the name of it? Fly, let, it fly. let It Fly by Jim Flegg. I'm sure it's Let It Fly by Jim Flegg. Uh, it's quite an old book, but it's a classic. Um, it really has got some fantastic information in it. Um, you can go online on the BTO online and they do in their magazine every month, they do a masterclass um, article, usually on a double page spread. Um, but that's all online and they did a fantastic series on various elements of, of, of migration. Um, so go on the BTO website and look for their masterclass uh, publications. Um, I'm sure I'm sure they're still, you, know, you can access them online. And the, the, there's a book I want to get. I don't know how long it's going to take me to read it, but Ian Newton, who I think is you know, up there with, you know, the godfather of British ornithology today, he's published a book. Uh, I think it's, an, I'm not sure if it's the New Naturalist series on migration. And mm -hmm. I, that, that, 
I, 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 I've only just realized about that existence and I, that, that will be, I'm sure, become the Bible. <laughs> he, is a, he is a wonderful ornithologist. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll do, we'll do one more. Um, let's have a look through. So, a uh, big question. <laughs> do oh. you think climate change will affect migration significantly? Well, I can only, you know, speak with, from my limited knowledge and I can't help thinking it must do. Just what I, the point I made towards the end there about the difference between the, what's going on in equatorial, equatorial sort of Africa and what's going on up here. There's, a, there's an imbalance. Um, and that's one of the problems I think we possibly seeing this year and last just to our own local weather, the insects are, 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 are coming out, invertebrates are hatching earlier than the birds are arriving. Uh, yeah. And that imbalance, it, it could possibly only get worse, um, which, which is frightening. Yeah, and that's um, that's a frequent thing we've had on most of our talks recently. It's, it's affecting all wildlife, so there's yeah. lots of things that we can all do. Um, and hopefully um, combat it or tackle it any way we can locally. Um, but that's all the questions. I'm sure uh, if, any, if we haven't had a chance to answer yours, please do email them in um, and if it's okay, I could pass it on to you. Um, but yes, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Trust and to all of our members, thank you for the talk. And I'd obviously like to thank our members for joining us this evening. Um, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to support us, please do so by, by visiting www.lrwt.org.uk. Um, and if you'd like to sign up to any more of our talks, um, you can do that. I'll be sending out an email to you all shortly and you can see our programme for the rest of summer and we'll be releasing our autumn one very soon as well. Um, so that's all from me this evening. Um, and I'd like to say thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the sun before it goes down. <laughs> it's on its Thanks. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.